May evening. Uh, it feels a little bit like summer. Um, tonight's Watershed Wednesday webinar series, uh, the messy rivers are healthy rivers. The role of spatial heterogeneity in sustaining river ecosystems will be presented by Dr. Ellen Wall of Colorado State University. This presentation will last approximately 50 minutes and there will be time for questions at the end. Please use the Q&A box to submit those questions to us. You're also welcome to use the chat, um, but just make sure that the chat is set to go to everyone. My name is Amanda Cavanius. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator with Green County Soil and Water Conservation District. This webinar series is being offered as part of 2024's Schoharie Watershed Month. Schoharie Watershed Month is a month-long series of free community events that celebrate and raise awareness of the waterways that flow across the Schoharie Reservoir watershed, as well as the 300 as the 315 square miles of land across Green, Schoharie, and Delaware counties that feed them. In addition to this evening's webinar, this year's Watershed Month offerings include the rest of this watershed uh, webinar series an opportunity to kayak the Schoharie Reservoir on Saturday, May 18th. All equipment will be provided for that event. And the BioBlitz celebration on Saturday, May 25th at the Mountaintop Arboretum, which will include a performance by Arm of the Sea Theater. Information about all of these events can be found on the homepage of our website, gcswcd.com. These programs are offered for free to the watershed community and have been made possible by the Schoharie Watershed Stream Management Program, which is a partnership between Green County Soil and Water and the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Again, this evening's session, Messy Rivers Are Healthy Rivers, the role of spatial heterogeneity in sustaining river ecosystems will be presented by Dr. Ellen Wool. Dr. Wool received a Bachelor of Science in Geology from Arrow. Arizona State University and a PhD in Geosciences from the University of Arizona. She is a professor in the Department of Geosciences at Colorado State University and a university distinguished professor. Her research focuses on physical processes and forms in river channels and floodplains and how these interact with biogeochemistry and eco ecological and human communities. She has conducted field research in diverse environments around the world. With that, I welcome you, Ellen Wool. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just get my screen share set up. And uh, if you are feeling too warm, I invite you to come to Colorado where it does not feel like summer yet. It's kind of chilly here right now. Um, all right, let me just get the slideshow going. Okay, does that look good from your end? That does, yes. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started then. Yeah, as, as Amanda said, I'm going to talk about what I refer to as messy rivers. Um, more technically, they are spatially heterogeneous rivers, and the spatial heterogeneity just refers to patches. Patch can be however you define it, but it's a continuous area of the surface that is distinct from adjacent areas. So if you look at the upper photo, for example, you can see small areas of standing water. Uh, those are uh, beaver ponds surrounded by greenery that's willows. So each of those ponds could be a patch. Or if you look at the lower photo, the pool here that is upstream from a log jam could be a patch. Again, it, it depends on how you define patches, but the idea is that the more patches you have, the more spatially heterogeneous the river system is. So I'm going to talk about what causes that and, and why it's important. And a little bit of background before we get into some of the details of this. Um, I'm going to talk about this idea of shifting baseline of perception, which comes more from social sciences and humanities. Talk about environmental context and uh, a very difficult question to address, which is what is natural. So starting with shifting baseline of perception, this is just the idea that whatever you are used to seeing is normal for you. So if you live in the middle of a city that has rivers that look like this, you might not think it's good, but you are probably likely to regard it as normal. This is the inside of a front cover of a textbook from Britain on river pollution. And I think most people would look at that and say, oh, that's terrible. It's really unattractive. What I found very interesting was the opposing front cover. So if you open the book, these would be the, the, the two sides of the around the fold. 
at first glance, this looks really nice, and it's definitely much better than the skeleton with the polluted water. But the more I looked at it, the more I thought, well, this is supposed to be a textbook from England, and uh, England historically was completely forested. There wouldn't have been big open meadows like you see here or parks. Uh, the more I looked at that, the more I thought, well, that that's a really kind of homogenous river. It's got some bends in it, but it, it's very you know, sanitized. So I'm going to come back to this image at the end. But the more I looked at it, the more I thought, well, I, I don't think that's actually a particularly healthy river corridor from the perspective of a river as an ecosystem, although, again, it's more attractive than the opposing image. But I think the, the point I want to make with the shifting baseline of perception is that we have largely lost many types of rivers in the temperate latitudes through centuries of human activity. One of those are systems like this that have been called river wetland corridors. So multiple channels that branch and rejoin, lots of either swamps or marshes in the floodplain, a high level of lateral connectivity between the channel and floodplain. We don't have too many of these anymore. They've mostly been simplified to single channel systems for navigation or flood control or waste disposal. So when we see, uh, many of us see a river corridor that looks like this, we think, oh, that that's interesting. That's, that's not really normal or natural or not what we'd expect. Uh, the second point I'd mentioned earlier was that environmental context. And this is just the idea that wherever you are in the world governs what might be a natural level of spatial heterogeneity or messiness. So I just took two opposing examples, the one from Alaska is the northern slope of the Brooks Range, uh, the tundra biome. The one from Australia is part of the Brisbane River, so the subtropics are in Australia. They're very different. They have different flow regimes, different uh, types of sediment moving down them, different biota. They're both quite natural, but the degree of heterogeneity or messiness varies between them and the sources of that heterogeneity. And that third point, what is natural, is actually really difficult to answer. Uh, it's very much a human construct, what, what we want to consider natural. In North America, it's very common to say natural is prior to European settlement because uh, European settlement equates to really extensive and intensive alteration of land cover and of river characteristics for things like mill dams or floating cut timber down rivers. But certainly in parts of uh, North America, and certainly in parts of the, the contiguous U.S., Native Americans had very substantial impacts on the environment and on natural systems. So are you going to go back to pre-hominid uh, settlement of, of a particular area? And if, you know, if you're in Europe or Asia, if you're trying to go back to pre-intensive alteration, you have to go back a few thousand years, three or four thousand years in some cases. Whatever time frame you choose, I think it's really important to emphasize that rivers and floodplains, so channels and floodplains, are dynamic natural systems. They have a natural range of variability quite apart from human activities. You know, we all know there are floods and droughts, there are uh, debris flows or landslides, there are blowdowns or insect infestations that affect forests and large wood coming into channels. So, so there's some natural range of variability which can be very hard to define if you've had a long history of human alteration in a, an area. A lot of times people will look for so-called reference conditions. So those could be the most natural river network or river corridor that you can find in a region. You're almost always dealing with some level of human alteration in the temperate latitude. So then it becomes important to understand the land use history, sort of the timeline for that, the spatial extent, the different types and intensities of activities that occurred. And I want to emphasize that this includes things outside of the channel and floodplain. You, know, you, you clear upland vegetation for timber harvest or for crops, that shows up in the records of sediments in the valley floors. And in parts of the world, that goes back to the Neolithic. So it, it goes back thousands of years, not so much in North America. Uh, but part of understanding that natural range of variability is understanding the natural variability in water and sediment regimes, again, apart from human alterations. So those are all backgrounds, but I wanted to, to focus in on what I call the reach scale. And a, a reach would be a length of channel and floodplain that have consistent morphology or geometry. So if you're on a headwater stream that you can step across without a running start, uh, that you know, reach might be tens of meters or uh, let's say tenths of a mile in length. 
if you're on a much larger river, reaches can be many kilometers in length or, or many miles in length. But within that reach, uh, when I think about a river corridor, which I used to refer to the active channel, the adjacent floodplain, and the underlying shallow subsurface water, I think about the how confined is the valley floor. And I was asking Amanda before I started this talk where Green County is, and she mentioned the Catskills. So you have a lot of rivers that are very tightly confined laterally. They're steep and narrow. There are other portions that aren't. So that's a starting point. Is there room to develop the type of variability in the channel and the spatial heterogeneity that you see in this drawing? And if you can see those terms off to the right of the river corridor, string and bead, those come from work by stream ecologists in the, the 1990s, where they said, well, if you look at many mountain systems in particular on a map or in aerial imagery, you see what look like beads on a string, where the string portions are the steep, laterally confined areas, and the beads are the wider valley floors with often lower gradient. So thinking about the dynamics of a river cord, it starts with what is this physical configuration? And then over on the left here, what I've called fluxes are what's coming into that river from the adjacent uplands or from upstream. So fluxes of water, which is Q here, sediment, which is Q sub S, and LW is large wood. Again, many of us don't think of large wood as being abundant in rivers because we have a long history of deforestation and active wood removal. But especially in the Catskills, you have a lot of landslides there. You have the, those um, glacial lacustrine units that cause hill slope failures. There would have been a lot of wood historically. And you've certainly also got beaver. Uh, I My own bad joke for myself when I was in the Catskills was it was a violent place. There were French kills, Indian kills, beaver kills, Catskills, and I know that kill comes from the Dutch word for creek, but there were a lot of beaver there. And beaver are a preeminent ecosystem engineer in the Northern Hemisphere, Castor canadensis in North America and Castor fiber in Eurasia. And I put biota here rather than beaver because there are other things too, the living riparian vegetation, dead large wood. In other parts of the world, you can have things like hippos uh, or in the Pacific Northwest, uh, Pacific salmon, the various species can really influence the characteristics of the active channel. So you have this context, the physical context that's really set by the geology geology, the rock type, the geologic history. Then you have fluxes coming into and through that and biota modifying that physical form or context. And the interactions among all of these influence characteristics like the spatial heterogeneity or patchiness, the three-dimensional connectivity. And three-dimensional is channel to floodplain and surface to subsurface and upstream downstream. The resilience or the ability of the river corridor to recover its pre-disturbance form after a disturbance such as a flood or a wildfire or a landslide. And then the degree to which the river corridor has geomorphic or physical and ecological integrity. Physical integrity here just means that if those fluxes or if the biota change, the river form adjusts. An example of a lack of physical integrity would be a completely stabilized channel in an urban area lined with concrete in the bed and banks. If you have more water or sediment coming in, it just moves through faster. The form doesn't change. So that's an absence of geomorphic integrity. Ecological integrity is usually defined as along the lines of having the complete biological community. Uh, so everything from microbes through vegetation, through animals, that would be expected in that particular setting in the world, so that particular biome. So again, I'm using this phrase river corridor to refer to the active channel, the floodplain. And if you're not familiar with this term, hyperreic zone, it literally means flow beneath. And it's referring to water that starts in the channel, it goes into the subsurface, flows downstream in the subsurface below the channel or the floodplain for some distance, and then returns to the surface. So it's different than groundwater. You can have water from the channel going into the groundwater, but then it moves at depth away from the river corridor. Or you can have upwelling where water from the adjacent uplands is coming into the river corridor from the subsurface. So the hyperreic you could think of as the shallower, shorter term version of the groundwater. And all these arrows in this block diagram are just trying to make the point that in a really natural river corridor, you have three dimensions of connectivity. Water and sediment don't just move downstream at the same rate or really fast or efficiently. 
Uh, you can close your eyes and think about a river corridor that's got log jams, it's got beaver dams, it's got channels that branch and rejoin. There are portions of that river corridor where water and sediment are moving downstream much more slowly. And maybe they're moving into the subsurface for a period of time. And that becomes very important in terms of storage and attenuating peak flows. You, know, you have a, a flood wave coming down the channel. If you've got a concrete canal, it moves downstream really efficiently. If you have a much more spatially heterogeneous river corridor, you're going to attenuate that flood pulse. You're going to store some of the sediment. If the water is going into the hyperreic zone, there are microbial communities there that are very effective at removing nitrate. If you're storing some of the sediment, you're storing the phosphate that's physically attached to that sediment. So the more the three-dimensional flows are occurring in a river corridor, the more you have the potential for that attenuation and temporary storage and biological uptake. So if you, I say river corridor rather than river, because if you say river, most of us, including me, just think of the channel. So if you say river corridor, it really emphasizes those interactions between the physical process and form, those biogeochemical reactions like microbial uptake of nitrate and the biota itself. And it also emphasizes that it's not just the channel. Uh, if you pay any attention to regulation and legislation in the U.S., you are very aware that the federal government has jurisdiction over navigable waters. It has no jurisdiction over the floodplain and none over the hyperreic zone. Uh, there are different legal frameworks that govern these different parts of the river corridor, which is completely artificial from the perspective of a river scientist because these three components are intimately connected in rivers. Okay, so coming back to this idea of spatial heterogeneity or patchiness, exactly what is it? Well, you can talk about spatial heterogeneity of the stream bed as you move across the channel or downstream. This is looking downstream to a log jam in Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. You can't see the channel downstream from the log jam, but it's steeper and it's bouldery. So the log jam is creating a backwater of reduced velocity where you get much finer sediment and organic material being deposited. So any patchiness of the grain size distribution of the, the substrate, is it sand or is it boulders of the bed forms, pools and riffles, uh, log jams or individual pieces of wood, those are all create patches. You can have heterogeneity of the banks. This is a very small scale version. You can see these little embayments and protrusions. This is along a, a subalpine meadow channel in southern Wyoming. Each of these little uh, embayments has a zone of flow separation. It's going to have lower velocity. There's the potential for sediment that's being transported to be deposited there or particulate organic matter. You're probably going to have finer substrate there. It can be a little temporary refugia for organisms that want to get out of the main current where they have to expend a lot of energy to stay in place. And of course, you know, you start thinking about a larger scale, meandering rivers, uh, constrictions and expansions as you go downstream, or even a, a slightly larger version of what you're looking at here, root wads associated with individual trees often create a protrusion into the channel with an embayment on either side. So various scales of heterogeneity in the banks. Cross-sectional form. If you have bed forms like pools and riffles, you have differences in the width to depth ratio of the active channel cross-section. And you may have asymmetry at the outside of the bend. You've typically got deeper, swifter flow, for example. So meander bends can create spatial heterogeneity of cross-sectional form. And then patchiness or heterogeneity in the plan form, which is simply what you see when you look uh, in an aerial image or a map. And this is an example of a river in the interior of Alaska. You can see it's meandering. It's got a whole series of cutoff meander bends that are gradually filling in. So they're uh, disconnected from the main channel at low flow. They form floodplain wetlands. And as they gradually fill with sediment, they become marshes or swamp environments. Uh, so how sinuous or, or how meandering is the channel? Are there, is there one channel or are there multiple channels? Those are all sources of heterogeneity. What creates this? Fundamentally, it's those geologic controls. The rock type and the history of uplift or glaciation determines where you have those wide, low gradient beads, the narrow strings in along the river. The vegetation and those fluxes, this is another iteration of what I showed you earlier, strongly interact with that geologic template to really govern the spatial pattern of sediment erosion and deposition, either during low flow or during peak flows. And that is 
occurring during lateral movement, say meander bends moving across the uh, valley floor or a braided river moving laterally across the valley floor very abruptly. And over more gradual time scales, changes in those bed forms or the, the grain size distribution of the active channel, the cross-sectional geometry and the plan form. So fundamentally, it's sediment moving around the valley floor being removed or added as mediated by vegetation, by beaver dams, by large wood, and what's coming into the river corridor. Do you during, is this occurring during a period of flood or after a wildfire, for example? And the, if you start looking at the dates on some of these titles that I'm going to put up here, during the past decade or so, people have really started to pay attention to how to characterize, how to, how to measure spatial heterogeneity in river corridors. And I had a PhD student, Emily Iskin, who worked on that. Uh, she just defended last year. These are mosaic images from some of the rivers she worked on around the continental U.S., and the different colors represent different patches. And in Emily's case, she was using metrics from landscape ecology to characterize the patches. And an example would be patch density, just how many different patches do you have per unit area of the floodplain? And generally, the, the more discrete types of patches you have, the uh, more natural the river is. We were trying to look at particularly natural rivers. So people are starting to quantify this. We're also trying to understand why it matters. Why, why am I giving this talk to you and who cares about spatial heterogeneity? Well, one is, I think, pretty obvious, habitat abundance and diversity. This is uh, the Yukon River in Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge, uh, where I worked for several years in the interior of Alaska. Big river, very dynamic, no human alterations. There's no dams here. There's no flow regulation. There's no timber harvest. There's nothing. There's no roads. Uh, we were dropped off by a float plane and, and had inflatable um, kayaks that we used to get around. So if you look at this image, there's the big channel. There's secondary channels here. There's partially uh, still attached secondary channels, much smaller ones. There's old cutoff meanders that are gradually filling. There are very diverse habitats here. So an example of one of these mostly filled floodplain wetlands, mostly filled with sediment and vegetated, one that's uh, more recently created through river migration and has much more standing water, an example of those secondary channels. So the more spatially heterogeneous the river corridors, the more abundant and diverse the habitats are. And that doesn't necessarily, but usually equates to greater biomass and biodiversity. And again, people are starting to quantify this. So a paper uh, that was published two years ago, looking at the diversity of freshwater fish that use floodplain habitats, and it really requires both that lateral connectivity between the channel and floodplain and also heterogeneous habitats at a variety of spatial scales. So what that just means is from the very small to larger. Second implication, what happens when you have a disturbance? So a very short disturbance or, or very discrete like fire, flood, or drought, or these more continuous disturbances like climate change or resource use could be aggregate mining, for example, from the, the floodplain or floodplain change in land cover. A resistant system is one that just doesn't change much when you have a disturbance for whatever reason. A resilient system changes but then recovers its pre-disturbance state fairly quickly. And the alternative to these is a sensitive system. So you have a disturbance and it just doesn't recover well. I'm going to show you an example of a very spatially heterogeneous system. You saw a picture of this earlier. This is in Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. And uh, the upper photo, the white arrow, is indicating flow direction. I'm standing on the adjacent uh, valley side while looking down in autumn. So again, you can see areas of standing water, multiple channels that branch and rejoin. The lower photo is at ground level early in the growing season when the willows are just starting to leaf out. It's hard to tell, but there are three channels coming together there uh, and the flow is towards the viewer. This is an extremely resistant and resilient system. If there is a fire or a drought, there's a lot of standing water. There's a lot of water stored in the floodplain sediment. There's a lot of water stored in the vegetation, and you may not be as concerned with this form of water storage in the Catskills because you get a lot of precipitation, but here, this is a semi-arid region. The adjacent uplands are montane conifer forest, and they're very dry. So the storage here makes the system more resistant to lack of water during fire or drought. When there's a flood, 
I promise you, it is very hard to walk through those willow thickets, and it's equally hard for water to flow through here. The The flood of record here occurred in 2013, and I was desperate to get up to this site. It's about an hour from my house. I, it's a long-term study site. First, I couldn't get there because all the roads were destroyed um, by the flood, and then they repaired some of the roads really fast, but our federal government had one of its periodic shutdowns, and this is a national park, so nobody could get in. When I did finally get in, which was about a month after, five, six weeks after the flood, I couldn't tell there'd been a flood. And this flood wrecked havoc in a lot of other parts of this river network. But it wasn't until I went to the upstream end of this beaver meadow and saw wood and sediment deposited against these willow thickets that I realized that the flood had, of course, gone through here, but the extreme hydraulic roughness had dissipated the flood peak very effectively. So... This is an example where spatial heterogeneity, in this case created by beavers, makes the system very resistant and resilient. And an example of this from another site in Idaho, uh, this was taken shortly after a, f a fire, I think it was about three years ago now. The uplands are completely burned, but the most of the river corridor, particularly in this middle section where it's been modified by beavers, there are dams and ponds, that was very resilient or resistant to the fire. And one of my colleagues who's now at the University of Minnesota, Emily Fairfax, has a paper with a really nice title. It's Smokey the Beaver. She looked at burned areas around the western U.S. and found that the valley sections or the river corridors modified by beavers were much more resistant to fire. They were fire breaks, and they were refugia for both plant and animals living in the river corridor, but also animals from the uplands that could go shelter in the river corridor during the fire. And this is the Smokey the Beaver paper, uh, which is, I think, being used a lot now by land managers and those who do river restoration in the Western U.S. A third implication, just keeping everything from going downstream like a fire hose. And I mentioned if you want to maximize conveyance or downstream movement of materials, make an irrigation canal and line it with concrete. It's simple, it's uniform, it's homogenous. That moves everything downstream fast, but we often don't want things to move downstream very fast. So what you're looking at here is a tiny channel in Rocky Mountain National Park. You could jump across it. It's three or four feet across. Again, to the left, which is downstream, it's a very steep bouldery channel. This is a very small log jam. It's almost a twig jam. It probably didn't last uh, through the next snowmelt hydrograph. I took this photo in summer. But while it was there, it created this backwater. You get this fine sediment and organic material there. And uh, Stream ecologists who work on things like microbial communities and biofilms show that if you can slow the passage of organic material, and what I'm thinking of is like leaves, twigs, organic detritus, if you can slow down the movement of that material, even for a matter of hours, you make it much more accessible to microbes and to what are called benthic macroinvertebrates, which is a mouthful for aquatic, the, the larval phase of insects like mayflies, caddisflies, stoneflies they can ingest some of those nutrients and start to process that material. They can take up nitrate for the, the microbial communities. Again, if you've got phosphate as an issue, it tends to adsorb or physically attach to soot and clay. So if you can store some of that, shunt it out into the floodplain, you, that retention is helping a lot. It's dispersing materials and diluting them. And uh, it doesn't have to be permanent on a geologic time scale. Fairly short time periods can be very helpful. So uh, this is um, examples of papers where uh, some of my grad students and I looked at how things like log jams or uh, living riparian vegetation can help to create the spatial heterogeneity that attenuates the downstream movement of some of these materials. Another implication, spatial heterogeneity influences that three-dimensional connectivity. It doesn't necessarily increase or decrease it. it the effects are more complicated, but it definitely influences connectivity. East Inlet Creek here is on the west side of Rocky Mountain National Park. And if you notice the what looks like a pile of twigs in the lower right, that's an old beaver lodge. There are no beaver on this channel now, and there are no beaver dams. But when there were beaver and dams, they would have reduced longitudinal connectivity because of those beaver dams. But the dams were obstructions that would increase lateral connectivity between the channel and floodplain by forcing the water over the channel banks. They also create a pressure gradient, a, a dam or a log jam or a large boulder 
that facilitates hyperreic flow. So it forces the water into the stream bed on the upstream side of the obstacle, and then the flow returns on the downstream side. And again, that hyperreic exchange is very important for creating cooler temperatures. So if you're concerned about brook trout, for example, or other cold water fish, cool water fish, you want more hyperreic exchange. If you're concerned about nitrate, that helps. So again, spatial heterogeneity doesn't necessarily increase or decrease connectivity. The details matter, but it does influence connectivity. And examples of this where uh, biocomplexity in that first title is, is another term for spatial heterogeneity. And they're looking at the influence of, or the interactions between connectivity and heterogeneity. Okay, so uh, the phrase river metamorphosis was introduced back in the late 60s to refer to a complete alteration of form in the river corridor as a result of human activities. In this case, I'm using it to describe a change from spatially heterogeneous to more homogeneous river corridors. And it's largely driven by whether you do or do not have spatial and temporal variations in flow. So do you have a natural flow regime with floods and droughts, or do you have a dam upstream that is was built for water storage and really takes the hydrograph and flattens it? So reduces the flood peaks, increases the base flow. Do you have natural spatial and temporal variations in biota? Do you have dead wood coming into the channel through tree fall or uh, landslides? Do you have beaver? Do you have native vegetation communities? And all of those things get at this geomorphic integrity. Fundamentally, can the channel and floodplain adjust to variations in water, sediment, large wood, and biota? And one way to think about this is when you have a natural river corridor, not, not all rivers are equally spatially heterogeneous. Some of them are, are simpler and more homogeneous than others. But I think I feel pretty comfortable making the generalization that all natural rivers are more spatially heterogeneous than rivers that we humans have gotten our hands on and simplified and homogenized. So as we've turned multi-channel systems where you have channels branching and rejoining into single channel systems, as we have straightened and channelized and stabilized the banks and removed wood and removed beaver, et cetera, and built artificial levees, we've made the rivers leaky in the sense that whatever comes into them moves downstream really fast. So we've lost that retention. And just a couple of examples from Europe, from really big rivers. The, if you look at the Rhine, the image on the left is a historic painting. That's a multi-channel system. There are big islands that the channel branches around and then rejoins downstream. And if you look at the image on the right, it always makes me think of an interstate. Uh, it's two navigation channels with a bunch of uh, small dams for navigation. There's a lot of barge traffic. And look at those banks. They are as straight and uniform as the engineers can make them. If you look at the lower images from the Danube near Linz, Austria, that 1812 image, again, there's a whole series of secondary channels that branch and rejoin. Uh, if you look carefully, you, you won't have time before I change the slide, but some of those channels just appear in the middle of the floodplain. Those are spring channels, hyperreic flow returning to the surface, and that's a big source of heterogeneity and habitat diversity if you have a cool, very stable spring channel um, in in close proximity to a channel that has through flow probably has more sediment, that's warmer, has more flow variation. But again, look at the right image, lower right, 1991. It's looking more like a highway, uh, straight, uniform, stabilized banks, and largely a single channel. So these are examples, but this applies to a lot of rivers of varying sizes in the temperate latitudes around the world. Okay, so... I talked about why spatial heterogeneity matters, but is there evidence that messy equates to healthy, getting back to the title of this talk? Um, we've looked at a series of different indicators that could be equated to river health. One is the ability to store organic carbon. You know, most people who care about climate change are really interested in how do you sequester carbon? Well, one way is to have wet floodplains, uh, the beads, the unconfined valley segments, and this is Nick Sutphin's PhD work from a few years ago. So the beads in the rivers of the, the southern Rockies in Colorado are less than a quarter of the total river length, but they contain about three quarters of the carbon that's present in the river corridor. And I knew the beads were going to be disproportionately important, but this was kind of stunning. So there's, there's a couple of things going on here. The beads 
are, they do have more surface area. So there's more area to deposit organic material, um, you know, leaf litter, large wood. They also have a higher concentration of carbon per unit area. You can deposit leaf litter that's, or large wood that's 50% organic carbon anywhere in a river corridor in any part of the floodplain. If it's in a dry environment, the microbes are going to say, hmm, lunch, and get to work uh, consuming that carbon or using it for their own purposes and releasing some of it as greenhouse gases. If it's in a, a saturated environment in the floodplain, so you have a, a high degree of hydrologic connectivity laterally with the active channel and vertically with the hyperreic zone, that creates what are known as reducing conditions. Think about swamp or marsh soils. They're black. They're saturated. They stink if you uh, churn them up. They stink because they're reducing. You're, you're usually smelling sulfur. But there aren't as many species of microbes that can live in those conditions. So the carbon is more likely to stay in storage in the sediment rather than being released to the atmosphere. So when we looked at these rivers, the valley floors in the whole river network occupy less than 1% of the landscape, but they store almost a quarter of the total carbon. And this was including living vegetation, so forests, upland soils. The, the bottom line is the river corridor is disproportionately important for carbon storage, and the wet portions of the floodplain are even more important. And another PhD student, Deanna Laurel, looked at beaver meadows, uh, which I was showing you photos of earlier. Again, they, they attenuate those downstream fluxes. They store a lot of sediment and leaf litter or organic material. When they are abandoned by the beaver and they start to dry out, they represent about 8% of the total carbon storage. And landscape here refers to the entire watershed or catchment. But when they're kept in a saturated condition, when the beaver are present and the dams are maintained, that's closer to a quarter of the total carbon. And again, this they are a very, very small proportion of the total land area in these watersheds. A second line of evidence, uh, retaining material in stream and removing nitrate and promoting biomass. Bridget Livers, this was her PhD work. She was part of a, a big team where we had biogeochemists and stream ecologists working with us. We found that when you have old growth forest, which is greater than 200 years for the average stand age, you have more large wood in the stream. And again, this is in Rocky Mountain National Park. So we were looking at areas with no history of timber harvest or wood removal, the wilderness parts of the park. That Those log jams create a lot of spatial heterogeneity in the channel. They create bigger, deeper pools. They create more connectivity with the floodplain. So you have that saturated, reducing conditions in the floodplain soil. So you get a lot of organic carbon stored. Our colleagues who were looking at nitrate uptake found that there was more nitrate uptake where you had more of these log jams. And our stream ecologist colleagues found that there was more biomass, so just more fish flesh uh, and riparian spider flesh. We, we were looking at the, they were looking at the predators. There's a high level of uh, productivity of the aquatic macroinvertebrates, so those larval stonefly, caddisfly, mayflies, et cetera, but they get chomped, so they support the predators. So you know, if you want to talk about stream ecosystem health, uh, spatial heterogeneity, in this case, as fostered by the log jams, is, really promotes this version of, or this aspect of stream ecosystem health. Uh, if you want to look at hydrologic residence times, that's just a fancy way of saying how flat, how fast does water move downstream. Again, think of an irrigation canal or a concrete canal in a city. All the water pretty much moves downstream fast and at the same rate. But if you have this three-dimensional river corridor, some of the water is moving across the floodplain, some is moving downstream in secondary channels, some is going into the hyperreic zone and then returning so you have a much wider distribution. Some water's moving fairly fast. Some is moving really slow. There's a lot in between. And if you have a variety of distribution rates, or excuse me, of, of flow rates going downstream, that means you're, you're reducing the flood peak. You're attenuating that peak and spreading it out over time. You could have the same amount of water moving downstream, but it's not as flashy. It doesn't all go downstream fast. So that generally helps for flood hazards, for infrastructure or people in the river corridor. If you have spatial heterogeneity, you've also got what has been called this floodplain biogeochemical mosaic. So the orange and brown uh, swath of river corridor here, the different colors represent different concentrations of soil carbon. 
the uh, swath that's shown in blue is the potential to remove nitrate from the soils. And this is uh, from the same field site as, as the last slide. It's a, a well-studied river, gravel bed river in Montana, just west of Glacier National Park. But again, the point is, if you have spatial heterogeneity, you have heterogeneity of processes like carbon storage or nitrate removal. Okay, so to put this in a historical context, I've been focusing largely on systems in the Western U.S. because that's where I've done most of my work. But everything I've said applies to rivers around the world, again, particularly in the temperate latitudes. We have almost eliminated old growth forest globally. Uh, we, depending on where you are in, in your part of the world, in the Catskills, you have, oh, in some places close to three centuries, certainly two centuries of actively removing wood from channels and to a lesser extent from floodplains. Uh, again, Europe, parts of Asia, it goes back uh, a few hundred years where they've been removing wood and deforestation goes back longer than that. So we've certainly reduced the potential for wood input. And I'm focusing on wood and beavers, but I want to emphasize that what I say about spatial heterogeneity, uh, you, know, you could apply that to a tundra river with no beaver and no wood. You could apply it to a a gravel bed braided river in the desert. There are different processes that create and maintain spatial heterogeneity. I'm focusing on wood and beaver because that's what I've done a lot of work on. But my highly technical terms for uh, what ecologists call alternative states, and if if you're not familiar with that term, it just means that if you took a, an ecosystem or a system, in this case, it could be a length of river corridor, there are at least two alternative configurations that you could have, and either one of those can be stable and persistent. You need some kind type of major disturbance to move from one to the other. So again, my highly technical terms for that with wood are wood rich and wood poor. Wood rich, you have natural fluctuations in how much dead wood comes into a river corridor. Again, landslides, blowdowns, ice storms, insect infestations, whatever you like. But as long as there's some wood, it's very effective at trapping other wood. So even though you have fluctuations in wood input through time, you are likely to maintain a high level of wood stored in the channel and floodplain. The wood poor scenario is what happens when you artificially remove the wood. So you take all the wood out for uh, log floating or you completely deforest the river corridor or the uplands. Now, if you look at this, this tree that's leaning over the channel, if it falls in, it's much less likely to be retained. It's probably going to be transported downstream because there's no other wood like downstream log jams to trap it. So studies from regions as diverse as the Pacific Northwest, uh, the Rockies, and Australia indicate that if you completely deforest a catchment and take the wood out of the, the river corridor, the channel and floodplain, it takes about 200 years to get back to pre-human alteration levels of wood. That's a long time. You can jumpstart the process, of course, by introducing wood artificially, creating engineered log jams or beaver dam analogs, but it takes a long time to restore it naturally. Beaver, of course, are at very low numbers compared to the estimates prior to commercial fur trapping. And the classic example of an alternative states for a river corridor is what ecologists call beaver meadows versus elk grasslands. So a beaver meadow the name meadow is established and it goes back more than a century. It, it's it's kind of unfortunate because it's maybe not a meadow. It's a, it's a marsh or swamp, but it's the idea that you have multiple beaver dams. Uh, they create channels that branch and rejoin. You have abandoned dams and ponds that are gradually infilling. It's a very spatial heterogeneous wet environment. If the beaver disappear for some reason, it could be trapping uh, in the picture here, which is in Rocky Mountain National Park, the beaver were outcompeted by the big ungulates. The elk and the moose have reached unnaturally high population densities because of the lack of predators, and they have largely eaten the willows out of existence. If anything's left, it's rootstock. There's not much above ground. So the beavers leave the area, they die, they disappear. The dams fall into disrepair. Peak flows uh, in this area, the snowmelt peak flow is more likely to be concentrated in a single channel, has a lot of energy. So that channel cuts downward. The banks erode. As you see here, you end up with a trench. The water table drops in the, the uh, riparian zone. So you have a drier system that's called an elk grassland. Now, it's really hard for beaver to reestablish in the scenario that you see on the right. If you were to drop off a 
happily mated pair of beaver and say, be fruitful and multiply. It's hard for them to build a dam that could withstand peak flows. It's hard for them to survive through the winter. They really need woody vegetation that they can cache under the water surface. Uh, so they're probably not going to make it unless there's some intervention like creating grazing exclosures or putting in a, a BDA and creating grazer grazing exclosures, BDA is beaver dam analog. It's, it's a human built beaver dam that the beaver can then enhance. But the point is, either of these alternative states can be very stable and persistent in the absence of a major intervention like physically removing the beaver or um, removing the effects of the big ungulates, the elk and the moose. Globally, of course, we have an awful lot of dams and diversions, just focusing on dams for which there are much better records. There's only less than a quarter of the rivers uh, around the world now flow uninterrupted to the ocean. We have widespread channelization, so straightening and bank stabilization that I have never found any global compilation for that. Levees, uh, one of my PhD students, Rich Knox, took this on for the contiguous US. Um, it proved to be remarkably hard to do. The Army Corps has a levee database, but they acknowledge that it's very incomplete. And it doesn't include all the levees that are not built by the Corps, of which there are many. But certainly parts of the contiguous US are highly affected by artificial levees that, and by artificial, I just mean human built rather than natural levees. They disconnect the channel and floodplain. So how spatially heterogeneous should it be? Well, it depends on where you are, and it depends on what's even feasible given the land use history and the existing constraints. These are just three randomly chosen photos that I had from rivers around the world. The, the ephemeral channel in a limestone canyon in Sardinia has very different processes and form and different sources of spatial heterogeneity than the little channel in Borneo or the channel in the Colorado Rockies. But each of them is a fairly natural system that has a higher level of spatial heterogeneity than, than one that's been altered by humans. So in thinking about this, I, I find this diagram very useful. It, in the lower left corner, you're talking about very local scales. So, you know, um, sorry, I'm used to thinking in metric. So less than a meter, let's say a, a couple feet uh, in length and very short time scales, minutes, uh, maybe to hours. As you go towards the upper right, you're getting to progressively longer time scales and larger space scales. And what this is showing is the different aspects of a river corridor and the time and space scales over which they change. So if you're looking at individual ripples and dunes in a sand bed channel, they're very local, they change fast. As velocity changes, they change quickly. As you go through the system, if you're looking at gravel bed or cobble bed streams, the bed configuration usually only changes during higher flows. So maybe the annual flood or the 10-year flood. By the time you get out to the upper right, talking about things like climate and geologic timescales for change, for the uh, degree to which the length of the entire river is concave upward, for example, or um, how steep it is. Everything else at the short to medium time and space scales usually reflects what we as humans have been doing. So things outside the river corridor, like land use and land cover, and then inside the river corridor, river engineering here refers to channelization, flow regulation, wood and beaver removal, et cetera. And the net effect of those has been to reduce spatial heterogeneity. And it may not have been, in some cases, it was a deliberate effect to reduce spatial heterogeneity. In others, you know, you're, you're um, conducting timber harvest in the uplands, you're probably not thinking about spatial heterogeneity in the river, particularly in the, a century ago, but that was the net effect. So as we go forward, as um, restoration practitioners or river managers, a lot of what people are focusing on now is how to restore some of this natural process and form. And it's got lots of different terms that are used, nature-based solutions, process-based restoration. But the point I want to make with this slide is that we really... To be able to develop predictive capability, we have to continue developing numerical models. And this is just a, a figure from a paper that was using a two-dimensional, so downstream and lateral dimensions, a coupled model of um, flow hydraulics, of velocity, shear stress, and sediment transport. Over the last 20 years, we've made tremendous advances in this. We are pretty good at predicting that. Now we need to keep working on integrating those models with other things like the movement of large wood 
or the growth and uh, characteristics of riparian vegetation. And using those to predict things like how spatially heterogeneous can the river corridor be if we change some of these inputs like water, sediment, or large wood. Uh, starting to uh, model three-dimensional fluxes, not just one or two-dimensional. One dimension is downstream. Again, two is between the channel and floodplain. And then using that to understand how the variables that were the characteristics that we're interested in, like organic carbon storage or organic carbon stock, nitrate uptake, biomass, how these will change. So I hope that when you, you look at a photo like this, if you haven't in the past, you'll you'll think about it as a river corridor that's got these three-dimensional fluxes that create these desirable attributes like organic carbon storage or nutrient uptake. And again, think of it as an integrated corridor, not just the active channel. And returning to this pair of illustrations, I asked one of our grad students a few years ago who was an artist to re-envision the river corridor, again, thinking about the context of England. So I'm not sure what happened to the dog, but the boy is sitting on some downwood. wood. He's catching a fish. There is a little bit of diversity in the riparian vegetation, and it's a forested river corridor, as it would have been historically in England. The, the light blue shading is indicating this cutoff that's forming across the inside of the, the point bar and the meander bend. The yellow is indicating a little bit more variability on the channel margins. You can see some bed forms here reflected in the, the boulders sticking up above the water in the riffles versus the pools. So it, it's, I think, a little bit more representative of what I, as a river scientist, would expect to see in a place like England, knowing something about its land use history and its, its ecosystems. And there have been a series of papers published by different authors talking about how most of us find a, sort of an open park-like, so uh, grassy or meadow areas with a few scattered trees and a, a slightly meandering river, the, the most desirable, the most attractive, and therefore the most natural river. We, we don't like big log jams or naturally occurring wood rafts. We don't like braided rivers. We don't like anastomosing rivers with secondary channels that branch and rejoin. Uh, and when I keep saying like, it, it's a function of that changing baseline of perception. We, we've gotten used to not seeing those things. So we don't consider them attractive or beneficial. And if you're interested, I think this talk is being recorded. I know this is going to go by too fast to to write some of these things down, but or you can email me and I can send you this address. I've had uh, multiple graduate seminars through time that have put together these, this story map that talks about individual river catchments across the contiguous U.S., including, as I recall, one in the Catskills. I let the students choose which, which catchments they wanted to focus on, and, and they talk about the characteristics of these catchments, what they were like, as far as we know, prior to intensive human alteration, how they've been altered, and what's going on with restoration in them. And I want to end by emphasizing that when we try to restore spatial heterogeneity in some of these desirable functions, it's not an all or nothing. The vast majority of cases, we can't go back to a completely natural condition. But this is kind of a nice example from the Italian Alps or the Dolomites. Picture on the left, 2005, you see these, these white areas where I'm moving the cursor are a series of check dams. The banks are stabilized here. There's a lot of land use in the floodplain. This would naturally be a braided river. So it was chosen for a river restoration projects. And you can see five years later, there's still the land use in the floodplain. They haven't restored all the lateral connectivity. And there's still a couple of check dams present. And there's some bank stabilization, but they've largely restored the braided characteristic of the active channel. And I visited the site in 2018, and many of those bars are partially or completely vegetated now. It was a succession of grasses that then were replaced by willows. I was there in a day in November that was kind of miserable. It was about 40 degrees and drizzling, and there were so many people using that river corridor. There were people fishing, watching birds, jogging out with their dogs. The people in the, the adjacent village were very resistant when this project was proposed because they didn't like braided rivers. They didn't think they were natural or attractive. The project won a, an award from the EU Water Framework Directive. And as I said, a lot of people use the river corridor now. And now the people in this community are advocates and they're trying to get people in adjacent communities to consider doing something similar. So again, it's not an all or nothing. You can go part way, get a lot of benefits and really 
start to change how people perceive and think about what's natural or appropriate in a river corridor. And this is a really interesting paper where they looked at place names in a variety of different European languages, including English, and showed how many places had names that indicated marsh, swamp, multi-channel systems with those secondary channels that branch and rejoin, floodplain wetlands. And most of those places now look more like the, the river here uh, in 2005. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and hopefully we have some time for questions. If I can stop sharing and thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. That was really wonderful. We do have time for questions. Um, so if folks would like, you're welcome to put that in the Q&A box or into the webinar chat. Um, if you're doing that, just make sure that your chat is set to go to everyone. Um, I I love that revision of that illustration that you shared. <laughs> it's really yeah, special. I, I asked her what happened to the dog and she said, I'm not so good at drawing a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure anyone would have noticed. <laughs> well, I look at this. Uh, I give this talk a lot. So I, I always notice, like, where'd the dog go? Because I also like, I don't have, I have a cat, but I do like dogs and cats. Yeah. The cat would be making a lunch for the fish, I'm sure. Right. <laughs> Definitely. I know one thing that always catches my eye in, in some artwork um, is the, the size of a, a culvert or a bridge. They're typically pretty tight and undersized. So going with, with a, like this. With a nice little waterfall downstream, if it's a culvert. Yeah. <laughs> Aquatic yeah. organisms abandon all hope. <laughs> you cannot enter here. All right, so I'm not seeing any questions just yet. Real. Well, I'll just say if, if um, anybody thinks of questions later or wants some of those references, and, and um, feel free to email me. My, it's just ellen.wool at colostate.edu. Or if you put my name in on Google, um, you'll find my email pretty easily. That's how I found you. So thank <laughs> you. Yeah. See, it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Great. Well, I guess with that, since I'm not seeing any questions come in, then we can go ahead and wrap it up for the evening. Thank you so much for being here. Okay. It's a real pleasure to have you and really such a treat to. Well, thank you. Said. Yeah. Thank you so much. Take Good care. Night. You too.